a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today on the 18th of November 2017, another wonderful Sabbath except for the weather outside, I've come to the table to read to you part 12 of the wonderful book Martin Luther wrote as his last work in 1545 published against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. Last time we ended on the bottom of page 332 in the book for the ones who are going to read along in the copy of their own book. You know, I provide a link where you can get the book in the description box of the video so you can read along. But I'm going to retreat to the beginning of the page to start with the very first paragraph on page 332 to get us in the mood and a little bit rehearse of what we were speaking about. As far as I remember, without even reading that right now, I was speaking to you about the way to Canossa, about uh, the German king Henry IV and uh, Hildebrand or Gregory VII, the Pope at that time. Uh, I've decided not to go much deeper into that because, in my humble opinion, I think there still should be something left for your own research to do. And um, this is not so difficult to do, uh, the way to Canossa, to study that. And you will see that uh, that is one example of many examples where there was a struggle. Uh, we also go into that in the very next uh, reading, in the beginning at least that there always was a big struggle about power in the world, even about power in the Roman, uh, in the quote-unquote Holy Roman Empire. The emperors have all been German, as far as I know. And that's why in Germany it was called the Holy Roman Empire of German nation. Yeah, at least at the time from 800 on. And um, the point that I want to make is, that even though the Pope crowned the Emperor and the Pope whether crowned the kings or the kings were only ruling because of the power invested in them by the Pope who got his power of course as we know from Revelation 13 from the dragon from the devil itself there always was a power struggle between the kings and the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire of the Roman Empire against the Popes and sometimes the Pope had the longer arm or the highest power and sometimes the kings had that. There are several examples where the kings even um, went into Rome and took the Pope captive. Uh, one of these examples is um, in 1302. 1303 I think was Pope Boniface VIII after his Unam Sanctum. Uh, the French king came into there and, and took him captive and he died in captivity. No? Um, and we have to understand this. Wh why can there be a struggle if there is a legitimate power on the top? Well, that's the point that Martin Luther is going to make in all this little reading, as, as, as far as you understand it, I hope, because we are reading here about the very first part of the book, where Martin Luther said in the beginning that he's going to prove with the reading of this part that um, he goes into what, what the Pope says. Uh, he says uh, whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom above councils, emperors, angels, etc. as he boasts. Yeah? This is still the subject we are dealing with in these readings here. And uh, well, the Pope claims to be above, uh, to be the head of Christendom and above councils, above emperors. So when he is above emperors, then of course, yeah, the emperors have no power over him. So that means 
he has the power to put emperors and kings into their position and not the other way around. But history proved that a lot of these emperors and a lot of these kings rebelled against the Pope. And what did Henry IV uh, rebel against? Well, Henry IV set up some bishops that he put into their office. Whereas the Pope, of course, says because he is the head of the spiritual and the temporal arm of the world power, that only he has the power and the office to put bishops and cardinals into their office. Because then he also knows that the one that he puts in there are obedient to the ultramontane policy of the Roman Catholic Church. Meaning that they will adhere to the ultramontanism, that they will adhere to the power of the Pope. Because you know the master who gives you the power is the master you obey, right? That's why you cannot serve two masters. Okay? So. King Henry IV of Germany uh, had a struggle with the Pope because he did not adhere to the ultramontanism and then the Pope excommunicated him and when he is excommunicated that means that he is um, he is a lawless one so that means that everybody can kill him and it is even a uh, meritorious work because to kill a heretic is a meritorious work and when you are excommunicated in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church, you are a heretic. And by that, of course, a lot of the counts and dukes and earls and all that in, in, in Germany were not obliged anymore to follow the authority of the king. So by that, the Pope took away that power and uh, he told him that his excommunication would be permanent within a year. So before that year was over, in the winter then, King Henry IV went into the Alps to Canossa and repented in front of the Pope. And if you want to get more about that story, like I say, then open up your own history books open up Google or any other search engine and uh, look out different stories that you can look and of course um, take care that you don't go into too Catholic friendly sources because then you will get a picture of course of the way to Canossa that really makes, you not, uh, makes you not understand the whole story. But anyway, that's why I don't go further into that because I think that you should be really able to do your own research in that regard and um, you know, the truth that you find out for yourself is the truth that you really appreciate about being uh, accepted by you because you found it by yourself. So, let's go back to the start of page 332 and then I'm going to continue reading in the book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil by Martin Luther, written in 1545. You hear there that Christ's words Quote, on this rock I will build my church, ought not mean that the whole of Christendom should believe in Jesus Christ, but rather, quote, only the Roman church was instituted by Jesus Christ, unquote. That's what the Pope claims. All the other churches, that is, all of Christendom, were instituted not by Christ, but by the Roman church. The dear Lord Jesus Christ knows of no more than one church in the whole world, the one church which he built himself, the rock through faith. But the Pope makes two kinds of churches, the Roman, which alone was instituted on the rock by Christ, and the other churches, which were instituted not by Christ, but by, perhaps the devil, or to put it much more mildly, the Roman Catholic Church. Again, the keys should not bind and lose sin, as our Lord said, but give the Pope power and authority over all earthly and heavenly kingdoms. I must stop. I can no longer rummage in the blasphemous, hellish devil's filth and stench someone else may read to. He who wants to hear God speak should read Holy Scripture. He who wants to hear the devil speak 
should read the Pope decretals, the Pope's decretals and bulls. Oh, woe, woe, woe unto him who comes along and becomes Pope or Cardinal. It would be better for him if he had never been born. Judas betrayed and killed the Lord. But the Pope betrays and brings ruin upon the Christian Church, which the Lord held more precious and dearer than even himself or his blood, for he sacrificed himself for it. Woe unto you, Pope! Woe unto you, Pope. Interesting comparison that Martin Luther makes here in the end of the first paragraph on page 332. He says, Judas betrayed and killed the Lord, but the Pope betrays and brings ruin upon the Christian church. Now why is it interesting? Because the term, at least in the King James Version, and that's the version of the Bible that I adhere to in English, in the King James Version, you only have two mentions in the complete Bible of the quote-unquote son of perdition. The first is uh, when it refers to Judas Iscariot, the one, as Martin Luther says here, Judas betrayed and killed the Lord, that person. And the other time uh, the title son of perdition comes up is in regard to the Antichrist, the Pope. So that is why the Pope actually is Judas Priest. Right? He is the son of perdition. He is the man of sin. He is Judas Priest. Woe unto you, Pope, by taking the words of our Lord Jesus Christ from Matthew 16, and twisting them around in a way that they fit your agenda and not the godly agenda. Now Martin Luther continues, this is the origin of the fearful raving and raging after the time of the Roman Empire. There they call themselves emperors and lords over kings and emperors, depose and dethrone them, let them kiss their feet, ban them, murder them and curse them. So this is speaking about what I was going to into uh, uh, during the introduction of this reading today. Yeah? They call themselves the, the popes, emperors and lords over kings and emperors, depose and dethrone them, let them kiss their feet, ban, murder and curse them. How they treated our German emperors, Frederick I and Frederick II until they openly executed the sole heir Conrad with the sword, Philip, Henry IV and Henry V. Yeah? Henry IV and Henry V were involved in the famous investiture controversy with Pope Gregory VII. That is the way to Canossa that I spoke about in the beginning. And next to these emperors you also had Louis the Bavarian, who was an emperor between 1314 and 1347. Antichrist Pope John the Twenty Second, who reigned between 1316 and 1334, banned Louis the Bavarian. After Frederick of Austria, another contender for the imperial crown, had lost the war over possession of the throne. They always wanted to make the empire headless, the popes so that the Pope could be Emperor. But King of Philip of France, and we read here of course in a little side note uh, that he was called Philip the Fair, Luther loved to tell the story of Philip which he associated with the donation of Constantine. Yeah? And I also would like to go into that a little bit because of the reading that I did in the book Rulers of Evil. So, let's first read this little sentence, and I'm going to take a little break, open up Rulers of Evil, and then we're going to read in that what I mean about, because this is really interesting in the historical context. But Philip of France made a fine example of Pope Antichrist Boniface VIII, the great chief rogue among the popes. This savage ruffian deposed King Philip, forbade France to honor or obey the king, 
and alleged that the kingdom had now reverted to the see of Rome because he would not do what the Pope willed. So, but the forces of King Philip followed him through a calumnies who caught him in Anani in the very room where he had been born, led him to Rome and threw him into the dungeon where he died like a dog from great suffering and inability to bear it. Actually Boniface was liberated by the Pope of Anani and died shortly thereafter at the age of 80, but that's almost the same because that imprisonment eventually got him killed. But such punishment is still far too mild, except that it would be good to do the same thing to other popes and cardinals. For it's a blasphemous, accursed office, the office of the papacy, so that even if one should wish to be pious, one should still have to be a blasphemer and enemy of Christ because of one's office. So now I'm going to read to you a little excerpt from the book Rulers of Evil on page 37 in the book which deals with the same history a little bit and it's quite interesting because we are going here of course into the Knights Templars. That is the story that uh, Tapasosi speaks about here in this book. So he says by 1300, yeah, so that's a few years just before uh, Pope Boniface VIII uh, published his Bull Unam Sanctam, that was in 1302, by 1300, presiding over the world economy from their Paris office, the Templars had become an international power unto themselves. Engaged in diplomacy at the highest levels of state from the Holy Land westwards, they set the tastes, the goals, the morality, the rules of the civilized world. Kings did their bidding when Henry III of England threatened to confiscate certain of the order's properties, he was abraded by the Master Templar in the city of London. Quote, what sayest thou, O King? So long as thou dost exercise justice, thou wilt reign. But if thou infringe it, thou wilt cease to be King. Unquote. But suddenly, at their very zenith, the poor knights suffered a strange reversal of fortunes. Now here I'm going to have to make a little comment. We are speaking here in this reading about rulers of evil, in this little part of rulers of evil, about the Knights Templars. The Jesuits are the revived Knights Templars. And what does Mart uh, Martin Luther, what does Tapa Saucy write here? But suddenly, at their very zenith, means the top of their power, of the Templars, something happened. And that happened after, in 1300, the Knights Templar told the King Henry of England, uh, King Henry III of England, to say, What sayest thou, O King? As long as thou dost exercise justice, thou wilt reign, but if thou infringe it, thou wilt cease to be king. So that means that the kings of Europe at that time were doing the bidding of the Templars, and the Templars are an order of the papacy. Just as the Jesuits, the revived Templars, are an order of the papacy today. And just as, believe you me, the Templars had control over the papacy, the Jesuits have control over the papacy too. And one of the very best, even for every stupid um, people, uh, person who wants to uh, go against anything I say here to understand it, that the Jesuits have power over the papacy is made very sure in the understanding that we have today that Pope Francis is a Jesuit himself. If the Jesuits do not control the white papacy, how can they ever put a pope on the chair of the white pope? Hmm? And by that control both sides, officially. They are controlling both sides already since centuries, as I made very clear through my reading in Rulers of Evil and Lorenzo Ricci, who used San Juan techniques to give to you the idea that uh, 
the Jesuits have been uh, made illegitimate by their banishing bull, uh, uh, Dominus Acredemptor of Pope uh, uh, Clement XIV in 1773, that was just a blown cover for co a blown cover as cover in the Sansuan techniques uh, for the Jesuits to go uh, undercover. But as you can read here, in the beginning of the 14th century, in 1300, the Knights Templars had absolute power, and to uh, confirm that and understand that even more, go to the, the book Rulers of Evil and read this uh, for yourself. You don't have to believe me, or you can read it for yourself. The Epitome of Christian Values, Chapter 6, there you can read that. And to me this is a quite um, a, a nice comparison to what we have today in 2017, where the Jesuits are on the zenith of their, or at the epitome, or at the top of their power in the world. And uh, as we all know, history repeats itself. And you all know the saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what the Jesuits do. And when the Roman Catholic Church was at their absolute power at the end of the 15th century, in the 16th century the Reformation came and took care that the power of the papacy was broken. Yeah? So this is why I think it is very interesting to even read Tapasorsi's Rulers of Evil a little bit in this reading together with Martin Luther, because we are reading here about this um, accident, <laughs> no, this incident, sorry, this incident, that Martin Luther speaks about, Pope Boniface the, the Eighth, And to understand that a little bit better, I will continue reading in Rulers of Evil for a moment. It says here, but suddenly, at their very zenith, so the zenith of the power of the Knights Templars, the poor knights suffered a strange reversal of fortunes. In 1302, King Philip IV of France dared to challenge their sovereignty on his own soil. He asserted that in France everyone, Knights Templars included, was subject to the king. That is what the French king said. So now we come to the big power struggle between the king of France and Pope Boniface VIII, because Pope Boniface VIII jumped in and declared that France, the king, the Templars, all of them, and everybody else as well, belonged to Pontifex Maximus. Now follows a quote from the papal bull Unam Sanctam that Pope Boniface VIII published in 1302. Quote, it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Unquote. Philip then accused the Pope of illegitimacy, of sexual misconduct and heresy. Antichrist Boniface VIII prepared a bull excommunicating Philip, but before it could be published, a band of the Philips, uh, of, uh, of the Philips mercenaries stormed the Vatican and demanded the Pope's resignation. Although the intruders were driven off, the shock to body and soul was too much for Boniface and he died a month later. This is how Tapasosi and rulers of evil explains to us what happened to Pope Boniface VIII and therefore we can take then the understanding what Martin Luther told us about it and this is almost about the same as he said here that uh, the forces of King Philip followed the Antichrist through a columnist and what's a columnist? That's a member of the Sciara of the Colonna family which had been driven out of Rome and had found refuge in France through this calumny, so these were people who were adhering to the king and not to the pope, who caught him in a nanny in the very room where he had been born, led him to Rome, threw him into a dungeon where he died like a dog from great suffering and inability to bear it. So, even though in the footnote it says here that actually Boniface was liberated by the people of Anani and died shortly thereafter in the age of 80, shortly thereafter that's about the months that Tapasosi speaks about. So we have two 
uh, witnesses, Martin Luther on the one hand, the older one, and Tapper Saucy, the uh, new one, on the other hand, with his rulers of evil, that speak about the same incidents about King Philip of France had a clash with, or a clash with the uh, with the Antichrist. And that is uh, just the same thing that happened a few hundred years before, as Martin Luther said here, uh, what the Pope did to, or how the Pope treated the German emperors. Frederick the I, the uh, second, he uh, executed Conrad with the sword, Philip, Henry the fourth, and Henry the fifth, and Louis the Bavarian. Yeah? So the popes have a history of dealing with different kings and emperors of the Roman Empire in this way, and that is why we are studying this little example of Pope Boniface VIII and the French King Philip. And that was at the end of the Knights Templars, because in 13 or yeah, a few years later, 1310 something, the Knights Templars were dissolved. Yeah? Um, they did not exist anymore as an order. I don't know the exact date that was anymore, but uh, you know this um, taking captive of uh, the leader of the uh, of the Knights Templars happened uh, on Friday the 13th. That is something you can also look up for yourself. Uh, Friday, uh, October 13th in 1307. Yeah? Philip arrested all but 13 of the Templars in France, tried them, and upon evidence of their practice of the Cabal, found them guilty of blasphemy and magic. At least 50 knights were burned at the stake. Yeah? This is history that you can uh, really look upon. So there, this, the temporal power all of a sudden um, was really punishing the spiritual power. And the kings of the earth, in, that, uh, in this regard, what we are reading here, King Philip of France, acted against the Knights Templars. So that would be the same as if, for example, um, the president of France today would act against the Jesuits in this country, which is, of course, not going to happen. But this is a comparison that you understand the historical connections between what I'm reading here in the book of Martin Luther and how Tapasosi wrote that a few hundred years later in his book, Rulers of Evil. So quite interesting to uh, view history from different points of views. This is what we've just did here now. And then Martin Luther still continues, but such punishment, uh, just to take the Pope captive and throw him into a dungeon, even that he dies like a dog, is still far too mild, except that it would be good to do the same thing to all the other Popes and Cardinals. For it is a blasphemous, accursed office. That is what the office of the papacy is, a blasphemous and accursed office, so that even if one should wish to be pious one would still have to be a blasphemer and an enemy of Christ because of one's office. But they have greater and much nastier hypocrites who goad them to such ravings and write that the Pope has every right to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a title that belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of Kings and He is the Lord of Lords. And the popes just assume that title. Along these is one who writes that the Emperor Nero ought to have given the Roman Empire to St. Peter, and that Constantine the Great was responsible for handing the Empire over to Sylvester, Bishop of Rome, against the will of the Roman Senate. That is why those great lies the donation of Constantine and Ludovici Primi and Ottonis Primi uh, in 66, so these are different uh, decretals of the Pope that Martin Luther is uh, referring here to, Decreti Prima Pars, uh, 63 and uh, 70 and 73. 
um, like the donation of Constantine, these documents are famous forgeries dealing with papal property, uh, also the TB Domino Johanni. All these documents were invented, and the Pope <coughs> refers to them as his legitimate um, authority to have rulership over the spiritual and over the temporal realm of this world. All these papers were invented, they were forgeries. All these papers dealing with the papal authority. The popes like this kind of lie and titillation. <laughs> yeah, because most people do not even care if the popes lie or not. They don't even check the papers. It tickles them. And so one fool robs the other of sense. Not that they believe it to be true. They know perfectly that it is otherwise. But they would like it to be spread among the people and believed by the whole world so that the emperors and kings might feel guilty of possessing their kingdoms unjustly and against God's will, kingdoms insolently taken and robbed from the Pope to whom they should hand over their possessions and abdicate. So what is the essence of what I've just read to you? The essence of what I just read to you is that even though the Pope builds his quote-unquote power on the spiritual power over the world and over the spiritual and the church realm of this world and his temporal power over the temporal, the civil world, over the kings, he builds all these on forged documents like the donation of Constantine, like the TB Domino Johanni, like also Tom Fress was speaking about in the past, the uh, uh, Isidorian decretals, they were also forged. The Pope builds his power on to show these to the people so that the people might believe it, even though the popes themselves know they are a forgery and they are not true, but that is not of importance, because it is of importance what the people believe. It is not important that you know that something is true or false, it is only important that you understand and believe what is told you to believe. That's the point. And um, there is an interesting quote from Henry Kissinger who said, and I quote here, It is not a matter of what is true that counts, but a matter of what is perceived to be true. So what here Henry Kissinger, a knight of Malta and a high Freemason, says in the end of the 20th century, is exactly the same what the popes were doing all throughout the centuries. Yeah? Let me repeat the sentence that we get that absolutely right. Not that they, the popes, believe it to be true, yeah? the TB Domino Johanni, the uh, Ludivici Primi and Ottinis Primi and Donazioni Constantini, not that they, the popes, believe it, would, uh, believe it to be true. They, the popes, know perfectly well that it is otherwise, means a lie, a forgery, but they would like it to be spread among the people and believed by the whole world so that the emperors and kings who have been given the power by the Antichrist might feel guilty of possessing their kingdoms unjustly and against God's will, kingdoms insolently taken and robbed from the Pope to whom they should hand over their possessions and abdicate. So that means that not even the normal, the lay people are in quote-unquote trouble with the Pope in this regard about what to believe, but that the Pope even puts the kings into a position that he gives them a kingdom and they are nothing more than just a caretaker. Yes, they are just the guardians. And that brings us, of course, back into the Rothschilds, who are the guardians of the Vatican treasury. And that is the same way that the Pope treats every king 
president and nowadays that they don't own anything because normally the king is the king because he owns that land but no they would own that against God's will is the understanding that the Pope gives to the kings and that the kingdoms are insolently taken and robbed from the Pope to whom they should hand over their possessions and abdicate so that with all these wrong and forged decretals like the Isidorian decretals like the donation of Constantine and the Tibi Domini Johanni uh, Ottinus Primi and Ludovici Primi all these papers not only the lay people understand but also the kings have to understand that it is the Pope who is above all and that the Pope is as Martin Luther says in this part of the book that we are reading here that the Pope means that he is above councils, above churches, above emperors, above kings, that he is on the top of the command chain. That is the point that we are dealing here with in, in, in this whole book already since a few pages since I am reading this. And he builds this up on papers that have been found to be a forgery. Yeah? I wanted to cover three things Martin Luther said. First, whether it is true the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom, that he is above councils, emperors and angels, etc. And Martin Luther proves here that it is not the case, but that it is a forgery that the Pope builds his, his authority on forged documents of the likes of the donation of Constantine and the other papers that I mentioned here. So this is when the Pope claims to have power coming out of this world, like when he claims that he has the power given to him by Emperor Phocas, you remember? Emperor Phocas, uh, Pope Boniface the Third. 606, the starting of the 1260 year day prophecy, as I call it, the true one, not the Seventh day Adventist uh, teaching on this. So, the Pope does not have the power and does not derive his power from temporal authority, from the, po uh, from the uh, emperors, but he is above the emperors and therefore he uses all these uh, decretals and bulls and papers so that is to say that he does not have his power from there so he turns to the Bible and says I have my power from the Bible from the world itself from for example Matthew chapter 16 which of course is not true as we have seen already in past readings and which we also will see in the common readings that whenever the Pope says I have my power from the Holy Scripture, <coughs> we see that he only twists the words of the Holy Scripture to fit his agenda. But that is not what the Word of God means and meant. Now, continuing in the book here, perhaps it might turn out that the kings of the world would fear the pasteboard devil or their own vision or the Pope's farts and beg the Pope to take over their kingdoms. The Pope does not display the keys with the three crowns in his coat of arms because he cares much about binding and losing sins, but because in doing so he attracts the king's attention to the decretal omnis and preaches and threatens that they should consider with what great insolence they withhold their kingdoms from the Pope. So, the point being here, that by giving the king's power, in one way, on the other hand, uh, giving not the king's power. I hope, I hope this, this, this comes clear. Normally, when you give a king power and a land, then that is from the king. But here, we understand now, 
that they are only the guardians of the land. It does not belong to them because the Pope claims it belongs all to them. I will put you in a position that you can be a guardian over it, that you can take care over it. You are the caretaker, but you are not the owner. The king actually does not own any land. It is the Pope who claims to own all that land because of papers like the forged donation of Constantine. So the kings are nothing but mere puppets. This is what Martin Luther makes very clear in this writing here. And this is dealing about the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church and of the holy, quote, Roman Empire of the Middle Ages. And that still goes for today. No king of any country really does own anything of the country he rules over. No president or chancellor or whatever has any power in this country. But they are only puppets put into their position by the power of the Pope. That's what Martin Luther makes very, very clear here. When, of course, you read this book with understanding. That's why I read it to you and I hope that you understand it, that every power the Pope has, he just usurps, he just steals. He steals from the people, he steals from Jesus Christ, he steals from the God of the Bible, he steals everything. The Pope is nothing but a great usurper. For all the earthly crowns are his, given to him through the keys by Christ, as Nicholas raves and farts in Omnis. That's what the Pope means. That's not what is, but that's what the Pope makes you believe. He makes you believe. Like Kissinger said, it is not a matter of what is true that counts, but what is perceived to be true. So as long as you perceive to be true what the Pope says here, then the Pope has his power. For all the earthly crowns are his, the popes, given to him through the keys by Christ, as Pope Nicholas raves and farts in his omnis. This is why the papal crown in Rome is not called a bishop's mitre, but Regnum Mundi, the world's empire, of which St. Gregory and pious bishops of the Roman Church knew nothing before the Pope came. This reference to St. Gregory is again uh, Gregory the Great, you know, the ones who said that who, whatever bishop will call himself universal will be the precursor of Antichrist before Pope Boniface III. This one Martin Luther refers here to. The world is divided into three parts. Europe, Africa and Asia, which are the three crowns of the Pope. Well, of course I do not agree with that here, because we all know that the coat of arms of the Vatican, with the tiara in it, stands for the powers over the three realms that are there, the heaven, the earth, and the underworld. Yeah? With the tiara, the Pope means that he is God of gods, <laughs> if you can say it that way, Lord of lords and King of kings, and he is the master above hell. Uh, beneath the earth, he is the master above the earth, and he is the master above heaven. So that's why you have this three crowns in one, this tiara. Martin Luther says that he is uh, the head above Europe, Africa and Asia, which are the three crowns of the Pope. So when you look at that tiara in that coat of arms of the Vatican flag, you have to look at it in two ways. You have, to look at, uh, you have to look at it spiritually, and you have to look at it temporally. And when you look at the coat of arms of the Vatican spiritually, you have to understand that the tiara, the crown, the triple crown, is giving the Pope, so as of course he boasts, power above heaven, earth and hell, and that the two keys are the keys that were given to him, quote-unquote, by Jesus Christ, which we know were not, to bind and to lose, or to, bound, uh, to bind and to lose on earth and in heaven. 
That's the spiritual meaning of the keys and the uh, of of the uh, of the coat of arms of the Vatican flag, and the temporal meaning is that you have the three crowns of the Pope, Europe, Africa, and Asia, and maybe we should uh, <laughs> also add America today, which was not that known in the time of Martin Luther. Don't forget this. He wrote this 1545. The American continent had just been discovered. Yeah? So you could maybe take Africa away and replace it with America. But the world is divided into three parts, which are the three crowns of the Pope. So the temporal explanation for Martin Luther here is the Pope's power about Europe, about Africa and about Asia, which at the time is correct. And the keys are the keys of the spiritual power on the one hand, the golden key, and the temporal power of the temporal power of the silver key. This is how Martin Luther explains to us the coat of arms, the Vatican flag, in the 16th century, in the 1500s. Huh? The world is depi divided into three parts, Europe, Africa and Asia which are the three crowns for the Pope, an explanation for his tiara at the time. The temporal explanation, not the spiritual. The spiritual is power over heaven, earth and hell, and the temporal is power over Europe, Africa and Asia. All the kingdoms of these three continents belong to the Pope, as the chapter Omnis and his hypocrites, I nearly said as the devil's farts, boast, and he is Lord over all the world. This is the crown the devil offered to our Lord in Matthew 4 verses 8 through 10, when he led him up, high, up the high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said, quote, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Unquote. But the Lord said to him, be gone, Satan. But what does the Pope say? Come here, Satan, and if you had more words than this, I would accept them all, and not only worship you, but also lick your behind. Unquote. These are the words of his decrees and decretals, where nothing is taught about faith in Christ, but all and everything about his greatness, majesty, power and lordship over churches, over councils, over emperors, over kings and over the whole world, even over heaven. But all of this is sealed with the devil's own dirt and written with the ass pope's farts. Now, I'm going to go a little bit back into this because I think I have to explain this a little more. With what I just read to you, we have absolute proof that the papacy and only the papacy can be the Antichrist of the Bible. Why? Let me repeat this. All the kingdoms of these three continents, Europe, Asia and Africa, belong to the Pope as the chapter Omnis and his hypocrites boast that he is Lord over all the world, as we know from the temporal and spiritual explanation of the coat of arms, the Vatican flag. This is the crown the devil offered to our Lord in Matthew 4 when he led him up high the mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And the devil said to our Lord, All these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. But the Lord said, Be gone, Satan. It is written, uh, You should only worship the Father in heaven. And him alone you should worship. So Christ did not take the offer of Satan. Of course not. But what did the Pope say? What did the Pope say when the Pope was made the same offer that the devil made to Jesus Christ? The Pope's response is, 
Come here, Satan, and if you had more worlds than this, I would accept them all, and not only worship you, but also lick your ass. That's what the Pope replies to the devil. Come here, and if you have more worlds than this, I would accept them all. I accept everything you give me, and I will not only worship you, but I will also lick your behind. That is the language that Martin Luther uses, and this is the language that I use. And you, if you are offended by it, then sorry, then go elsewhere. This is what we speak here about. This is the unbridled truth. The Pope says, I'll accept everything that you give me, and I don't only worship you, I also lick your behind. That is what the Pope replies to the offer when Satan offers to a man what he offered to Christ before. Christ would not take it, of course not, but a man took it in the place of Christ, the Pope. And there you have irrefutable proof that, of course, the papacy and only the papacy can be the Antichrist. An offer Satan made to Christ and Christ rejected, the Pope not only accepts, but he says, even if you have more worlds, I would take them all, and I would not only worship you, but I also lick your behind. Is there any more devotion you can show to anyone but to lick his behind? I don't think so. And that's the point that Martin Luther wants to make. Worship is one thing, but to creep into another's behind, I think is even more to just worship. And that's the spirit of of Antichrist. That's the spirit of the popes. Come here, Satan, the Pope says, and if you had more worlds than this, I would accept them all and not only worship you, but also lick you behind, because Satan says to the papacy, all these kingdoms of the world and splendor I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And where Christ, of course, rejected that and said it is written, you should only worship the God in heaven and him alone should you worship the Pope says come here Satan I accept them all and not only worship you but I also lick your behind powerful writing of Martin Luther right here and powerful understanding of Martin Luther right here that he absolutely comes to the point that the papacy is the Antichrist because he accepted the offer that Jesus Christ rejected of Satan, even though Jesus Christ was tempted for 40 days in the desert. The Pope, you don't even have to tempt for 40 seconds, and he will agree. And that's what he did. And that's what the office of the papacy did all through history, all through the centuries, up to 2017, where we are today, and up to the time that is still going to come. The popes will always accept the offer of Satan that they are given the splendor and the kingdoms of this world. This is where the power really derives from. This is where you have your roots in Revelation 13 when it says the first power was given, the, the first beast was given the power of the devil, of the uh, of, of Satan. It says so in Revelation 13. Right? Let me just look that up. Yeah, I'm going to pick up my King James Bible and we're going to read in Revelation 13. And there it reads, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. In verse 2, And the dragon gave him his power. Who is the dragon? The dragon is just another word for Satan. Right? And when Satan here comes in Matthew 4 to Jesus Christ and promises him all the kingdoms and all the splendor of it, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me, Jesus Christ of course said, Be gone, Satan. He did not accept the offer. But the Pope, what did he say to the same offer? The Pope who is on the top of the beast that looks like a leopard, 
and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him, the Pope, the papacy, his power and his seat, and great authority. What is his reply? Come here, Satan, and if you had more worlds than this, I would accept them all, and not only worship you, but also lick your behind. That is the difference between a carnal, evil-possessed man of the Pope and our Lord Jesus Christ. He, Jesus Christ, rejects that. And, of course, uh, he rejected because he knows he is given something much better by his father than anything the devil could ever offer to him. But the Pope says, I want the riches here in this world. I want the riches right now. Come here, Satan, and if you have more worlds than this, I would accept them all, and not only worship you, but also lick your behind. When we read this in the understanding of Revelation 13, verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, Satan, gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority, well, then you know that everything that the Pope says about that he has been given the seat by the temporal power, Emperor Focus, for example, is a lie, and that the power has been given to him in Scripture, through Matthew 16, then you know that is a lie. Revelation 13 tells you that the power was given to the Pope, and his seat, and great authority, by the dragon. The dragon is Satan. That is where the power of the Pope derives from. That is a point that Martin Luther does not make in this book right here, but I hope that you understand from this reading. The power has been given to the Pope by Satan. Not by any emperor, not by focus, not by anybody else. And it has not been given by Jesus Christ through Matthew 16 to the quote-unquote successor of Peter, who has not even been given the keys, who has only been promised the keys, and who has never received them, and even though the Pope is not the successor of, quote-unquote, Peter, but the successor of Simon Magus, that's another point. So you see here, you only have to understand Revelation 13 to dismiss all the claims of the papacy of any temporal or spiritual power in this world. As Martin Luther says, what does the Pope say to the offer of Satan? All these kingdoms and splendor I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Come here, Satan. I accept them all. Not only worship you, but also lick your behind. These are the words of his decrees and decretals where nothing is taught about faith in Jesus Christ, but all and everything about his greatness, majesty, power and lordship over churches, over councils, over emperors, over kings and over the whole world, even over heaven. But all of this is sealed with the devil's own dirt and written with the ass pope's farts. Well then, this has dealt briefly with the first damage the Pope has caused with his binding. For who can recount everything that the devil, through the Pope, has been able to accomplish with the murder and betrayal of kings and emperors? They are temporal lords ordained by God. Why do they tolerate such things from such a rotten paunch, crude as Pope and fart as in Rome? Why don't they ask God's word and true preachers? But God's wrath has punished the world in this way. Why do they, the kings of the earth, tolerate such things from such a rotten paunch, crude as Pope and fart as in Rome? Why don't they the rulers of this world and the Catholic people, the people who fill the Roman Catholic satanic churches, 
Why don't they ask God's word and true preachers? Because God sent them a strong delusion. The strong delusion that the Antichrist is one single individual that will come in the off far future. Why don't they ask God's word and true preachers? Because people don't open their Bible anymore today. And only in the Bible you can find all answers as I just showed you. Revelation 13 verse 2 gives the answer to where the Pope really has his power from. Not a temporal king or emperor. Not a spiritual reason like in Matthew 16. Nothing of this has given the Pope the power, but, as it is written in Revelation 13, verse 2, the dragon gave him his power, he gave him his seat, and he gave him great authority. That's the only authority the Pope has, the authority of the devil, not the authority of Jesus Christ. Why don't they ask God's word and true preachers? Because they don't know God's word anymore. And where the hell do we find today true preachers? This is where I'm going to end the reading for today. I'll leave you on the top of page 335. I thank you very much for watching the video, listening and commenting and again I do not excuse myself for the quote unquote foul language that here and there Martin Luther uses because Martin Luther is absolute in his right to use these words and these expressions to make his point I would accept them all and not only worship you but also lick your behind lick your ass as Martin Luther writes here, in this case, lick your behind. He doesn't use the word as in this occasion. He uses another word occasions. I use it sometimes to make the point. To make the point. Why don't they ask God's word and true preachers? If they did, the world would be a better place. We should all ask God's word and true preachers to come to the knowledge of the Bible. Jörg from Jogler 66 says thanks for watching, listening and commenting. God bless you and until next time. Bye bye. witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of every lie. There is no escape. Proverbs 19.5. I will tell the truth for every lie Proverbs 19.5 A false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape A false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape